If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2, we will be looking at verses 1 through 21. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. It is indeed an incredible honor to be standing before you all today, people of God, especially on a special day like Pentecost Sunday. God has um, provided in his providence an opportunity for me to speak both on two brilliant uh, holidays in the church calendar, one on Easter and now on Pentecost. What a blessing. Today, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit afresh on the church. And that leads me to ask you this question. Think about this. Who do you believe that the Holy Spirit is? What, what do you think he does? You see, in, in our day, in, in our church, we, we tend to lean to two extremes. Either we teach too much on the Holy Spirit or we teach too little. You see, brothers and sisters, this should not be among Trinity Presbyterian nor in the entire PCA. The Holy Spirit, as the Nicene Creed states, is the Lord and giver of life and the pioneer of our sanctification. Our Christian life is encompassed by him, and the passage that we're going to be looking at today emphasizes what he begins to work in the New Testament church. You see, when we look at the title of the book of Acts, if you find it in your Bibles, the typical designation that we give it is the Acts of the Apostles. I propose a different title, as myself and many other scholars propose, this title, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, why, why do we have this title? Because he is the one who empowers the Acts of the Apostles, as we see in this text. He is also one who empowers us Christians. As we look into the Word of God, I want you to see how the Holy Spirit of God displays his transforming power. Not only in the lives of the apostles, but also in our lives as well. Let's look at our text. Hear the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Met residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, saying, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace given to us 
that we can hear your word spoken and preached. We know that it is the fulfillment of the work that you did at Pentecost. We pray that as we look into the word of God, we might see your Holy Spirit and we might see his work in our lives. Lord, as we, as we listen to your word, do not let your people see me, but let them see you. Open our eyes and open our hearts so that we might see you for who you truly are. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So today I want to point out three things for you. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the transformer of our hearts. Number two, he is the proclaimer of the gospel. And number three, he is the builder of the church. Let's look at our first point. The Spirit is the transformer of our hearts. Pay attention to verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So look at the words used here to describe the very Spirit of God. You see a mighty rushing wind. The Spirit is described as breath and as fire. These terms represent the very power of God and the passion of those that have been transformed by God and, and the love that they have towards him. You see, this is just like the vision of Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. I mean, you guys have been in church. You know that story very well in Ezekiel 37. You see, God calls Ezekiel to go down into this valley of dry bones. He commands the prophet to prophesy to the bones. And when he does, a mighty wind comes and gives life to those bones. And listen to what God says to Ezekiel after that event. He says, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will pour out my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. You see, God says that the same spirit that he uses to restore fallen bones is the same spirit that he will use to restore fallen Israel. It's just like he said in the previous chapter, in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27, this is what God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see here, God has promised to take out our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh so that we might obey God's rules and love him. You see, this is the same spirit that God has promised that fell on Pentecost Sunday. And he is the one who lives within us today. He is the spirit that powerfully transforms our hearts. And so how did that heart change, that, that regeneration, look like for the apostles? Apparently, it's these tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit rested upon them visibly and filled them with power. They filled them with this, this encompassing affection for Christ that begins to fill their very soul. It's the power that causes one to love God and love his word. It's that power to cause you to truly see and love who Jesus is. You see, it, it's just like what happened to two of Jesus' disciples on the road to Emmaus. You see, after the crucifixion and during the time of the resurrection, these two disciples were walking depressed until they encounter the risen Jesus. Jesus expounds the Old Testament concerning himself to them, and then when he disappears... We hear these words. The disciples say to themselves, did our hearts not burn within us as he talked to us on the road 
when he opened up the scriptures? Did our hearts not burn within us? Or maybe take the example of one of our fathers of the church, St. Augustine. You see, before Augustine was converted, he was a man of incredible lust. You see, uh, Augustine openly confessed that, that he was a sinner. And not only was he a sinner, but he loved doing it. However, as he grew older, most likely in his, his teenage years, his Christian upbringing, because he was, he was raised by a Christian mother, suddenly began to cause a war within his soul. And he entered into a deep depression until he was about 33 years old. And while he's contemplating in a garden at this age, he tells us of this particular event in his book, The Confessions. Listen to what he says. Suddenly I heard the voice of a boy or a girl chanting this over and over. Take up and read. Take up and read. And so I quickly returned to the bench that I was sitting at, snatched up the apostle's book, and in silence read this paragraph on which my eyes fell. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Romans 13, 13. He says, I wanted to read no further, nor did I need to. For instantly as the sentence ended, there was infused in my heart something light, like the light of full certainty in all the gloom of doubt vanished away, end quote. You see, look at these two particular situations. You see, through the word of God, it causes the disciples' hearts to burn. And in reading the word of God, Augustine is converted where a light shines within his heart. Here by the Holy Spirit, there is a powerful conversion. There is a burning within. There is a brightness of light within the heart. This is the experience of one who has been touched by the transforming power of the Holy Ghost. So let me ask you this, Christian. Have you experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember a day in which your heart fully began to burn for the things of God? Do you remember that one day where God took out your heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh? That one day where you first loved your sin, now you begin to hate it. You see, that day was and still is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, because he, the Spirit of God, is the one who breathes new life into us. He is the one who shines a light so that we can understand the word of God. He is the one that fills us with love for God. Beloved, I pray that you continually have that experience. Every time you open up the word of God. And I pray that you will pray that the fire for God in you never wanes and never wavers, but that you might always be filled with the Spirit. That leads us to our second point. We see that the Spirit is the one who transforms us, but he is also the one who proclaims the gospel within us. Look at the beginning of verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, it began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then go all the way down to the end of verse 11. The people are saying that we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. You see, when the apostles are filled with the Spirit, the first thing that comes out of their mouths is a declaration of the mighty works of God. And what does the indwelling of the Spirit look like in verses 14 through 21? Contrary to what we seem to expect in our day when we talk about the, the filling of the Holy Spirit or being taken over by the Holy Spirit, we don't see many of the things that we see today. Instead, we see a verse-by-verse, Bible-based proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is exactly what Jesus promised that the Spirit would do in Acts chapter 1. Turn a chapter backwards and let's look at the first chapter of the book of Acts. And look at verse 8. Jesus tells his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Jesus said that the apostles, filled with the Holy Ghost, will be his witnesses. Pay attention to that word witnesses because it's really important. You see, the word witness here is in the Greek martyrios, which means witness or testimony. But it also sounds very similar to a word that we often know of. The word martyrios is also where we get the term martyr from. It's where we get the term martyr from. Throughout the lives of the apostles, we see that the Holy Spirit empowers them to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in every situation, even unto death. Consider the apostles in Acts chapter 5. They've been brought before the Sanhedrin and charged not to speak in Jesus' name again. And Peter boldly declares that they must rather obey God than men. Then we hear these words in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. And when they had called in the apostles, the Sanhedrin, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. What is it within them that causes these men to be beaten and charged by the leaders and they leave rejoicing that they've been accounted to suffer for the very name of Christ? That's the Holy Spirit, my friends. We see the apostles not only stood before the Jewish leaders proclaiming Christ, but they also went to their deaths for the sake of their apostolic witness. Hear the testimony and tradition of the church on how some of the apostles died. Let's look at the apostle Paul. How did he die? He was beheaded in Rome in 64 AD under the orders of Emperor Nero. The apostle Peter, head of the church, in Rome he died and he was crucified upside down because he did not consider it worthy to die in the exact same way as his master and Lord. Thomas, old doubting Thomas, he was impaled with a spear while evangelizing in India. And St. Andrew, he was crucified, but not in the same way Christ was, he was crucified in an X shape. I wonder why in our Alabama flags we usually have the red X on it. That's St. Andrew's cross. And then the disciple who Jesus loved, John, he was boiled in oil and then sent into exile on the island of Patmos, where he received the book of Revelation. You see, in every situation, the words on the apostles' lips, even to their deaths, were the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether to either comfort them or to preach it to others, whether in chains or as they enter the grave, whether the good times or as well as the bad. The gospel to them was central, and it was the spirit of the living God who empowered them to preach boldly in their situations. And now, in our time, we might not face martyrdom for the sake of the gospel. That might not happen in our day. But one thing is true. Every single one of us will face trouble. If you haven't, surely you will. <laughs> I mean, just look around us. It's 2022. Countries in uh, countries in Asia are at war. The United States is divided by every demographic you can think of. A virus continues to ravage our world, and even worse, gas is over four dollars a gallon. <laughs> if that's not trouble, just ask my wallet. <laughs> so when you face the troubles of your life, what do you find yourself clinging to? What comforts your soul when you find yourself crying into your pillow in the middle of the night? Do you remind yourself of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you lean upon the spirit to console you with the reality that since Christ is taking care of your biggest need, you don't have to worry about all the trouble that comes to knock at your door? Do you remember your only hope in life and in death? That your life is not your own, but you belong both body and soul in life and in death to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you remind yourself of that when you're in trouble? And if you do, why? Because it's the Holy Spirit 
who reminds you of those things. It's the Holy Spirit who preaches the gospel to you. It's the Holy Spirit whom Jesus prophesied would take what is his and what has been purchased by him and bestow it upon you. He is the one who takes the comfort that has been purchased by Jesus Christ on the cross and places it in your heart. Brothers and sisters, just ask him when you're in trouble and he will preach comfort to your very soul. This leads us to our last point, that the Spirit of God is the builder of God's universal church. Let us look back at Acts chapter 2 and look at verses 5 through 11. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at its sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are, these, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Aphrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. We see here that men from every nation under heaven have gathered together to celebrate this Jewish holiday. Each of these people heard the gospel preached, and not only the gospel preached, but they heard it preached in their own language. Now, this might not seem amazing in our day, but in the first century it was. Why was it amazing to them? It's amazing because it shows that the gospel is not just for specific converts to Judaism. The gospel is for men of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. It's amazing because it shows a reversal of the curse from the Tower of Babel. Now, you guys also know the story of Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, where God confused the languages of men in order to divide them. Now, why did he divide them? Because they were united in their sin and their rebellion against God. And so God scattered them. But now, instead of using language to divide people, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God uses tongues and other languages to unite everyone under one banner, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, now in this, in this mighty act of God, the people of God is not just a single nation anymore where you have to enter in in order to be called God's people. Now, it is believers that span across the entire world. Now, why does this matter? It matters because in some religions, they force their adherents to conform to the behavior and the culture of a specific ethnic group. Now, what do I mean by that? As some of you know, and some of you might know, I am an internet apologist, and I've been spending around eight to nine years or so doing apologetics to those under Islam, the religion of Muhammad. Now, in Islam, they require its adherents to read and recite Arabic. Since the Quran was written in the language of the Arabs, it can only be properly read and understood in that language. And so if you want to become a Muslim, one must make their statement of conversion, or the Shahada, in Arabic. One must also wear Middle Eastern clothes, or at least incorporate them into your dress. You must, you must act in a certain way. You must behave in a certain way. You must wash your hands in a certain way. You must bathe in a certain way. I could go on. Everything in Islam must conform to a Middle Eastern Arabic culture. But instead, with the multi-ethnic power of the gospel, I can go to Asia. I can go to Mexico. I can go to Russia, I can go to Europe, and I can even stand here in America. And in every single place, in a Lord's Day like this one, you can hear them all in their own language, sing hymns to Christ as his God, and recite the Apostles' Creed together. Because our unity is not found in our dress. It's not found within our culture. It's not found within the things we say or do, nor is it found within how much melanin that we have in our skin or how less melanin that you have in your skin. 
Our unity is based on the truth that Jesus died for our sins, that he was raised for our justification, and now he has sent his spirit to unite us to Christ and unite us to one another. So Christians, let me ask you this. How do you feel about the universal church? How does the truth of the, of the universal church motivate you? Do you have a hope for the conversion of the nations? Is your hope for the church the same hope as the spirit of God? That the knowledge of God should cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Brothers and sisters, let that be your hope. Because the Holy Spirit is at work in his church. Pray that he will spark in you a love for the nations. Pray that he might cause you to be the hands and feet of Christ. Not only for the nations, but also in your own situations. For those closest to you, for those who are at work or those within your family. Pray that he might motivate you to preach the gospel to them. Now, what is the gospel that you preach to them? You tell them, first and foremost, that they're a sinner. That in their sin, they have committed cosmic treason. And therefore, they deserve to be crushed by an all-loving and just God. But because God is all-loving, he has sent down his son, truly God and truly man, to live a perfect life which none of us could ever live. We were supposed to live that perfect life, but every single time we do, we fail. Christ has achieved it all with his active obedience. And then he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. He has, he has taken your sin and took it upon himself and pinned it to a rugged cross. For three to six hours, he bore the very wrath of God on our behalf. He died for our sin. Oh, but he did not stay dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, taking the keys of death in Hades and proclaiming that he has all power in heaven and earth. He has ascended to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and now he rules as king over all creation because he created all creation. And now he has sent forth his spirit to convert the nations. And so what does that mean for you, sinner? That means if you repent, what does repent mean? It means to simply change your mind. It means to simply take a view of your sin that you once loved and now hate it. And now you turn to something else, someone else. You turn to Jesus. You have faith in him. What does faith mean? It means that you trust in what he did. That what he did was true and what he did, he did on your behalf. And if you do that, your sin will be traded for his righteousness. Your sorrow will be traded for his happiness. Your weakness will be traded for his strength. You will be made righteous before God. You will be justified and you will be saved. You will be a fulfillment of what God has prophesied in Joel chapter 2 as he unites the church together. That everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us your spirit to convert the nations and unite all of us together under your holy name. We thank you for that. Father, empower us as we go out today, reminding ourselves that it is your Holy Spirit that has transformed our heart of stone into hearts of flesh. That, that you are the one who proclaims the gospel to us even in our darkest times. And that you are the one who empowers us to reach the nations. Father, let us all go out and proclaim your name so that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and God the Holy Spirit. One God forever and ever. Amen.